Welcome to College Basketball Recruiting Weekly. I'm 24-7 Sports Director of Scouting Adam Finkelstein, and we are here for conference previews. Here's how we're going to do it on the show. We're going to talk about three things for each major conference. We're going to talk about the best players in the conference. We're going to talk about the best NBA prospects in the conference, because they're usually not the same. Then we're going to talk about the real contenders. Who's got a legit chance to win the conference championship this year. We're gonna begin with the Big 10 and the Big 12, and I'm gonna welcome in 24 seven sports national writer, Isaac Trotter to help me break it all down. All right, Isaac, welcome to the show. You just launched the 100 best players in college basketball, and I can only imagine the amount of hate mail you got from that. How was that? Did that treat you well? Yeah, no, that was super fun. Uh, I feel like I had a lot of people say players that I missed, but there weren't that many players that they said that should be taken off the list. So I feel like that meant I did a decent job. Yeah. All right. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go through your top five players, according to that list, in each conference. You're going to get to break them down. I'm then going to talk about what kind of NBA prospect I think they might be. And then we're going to flip it. I'm going to talk about who the best NBA prospects are in the class. You're going to talk about what we might see from them this season. Sound good? I'm all in. All right. So the Big Ten, no surprise here. Number one player in the Big Ten is the number one player in all of college basketball. Zach Eady, what do you got on the big fella? Purdue outscored opponents by 22 points per 100 possessions with Zach Eady on the floor. During conference play, it was minus 15 when he went to the bench. Like, he has as much of an impact on his team as anybody college basketball has seen in a really, really long time. Super special player. I expect him to be dominant again. We saw last year, like Oscar Shibwe wins National Player of the Year. That year after is a little bit tougher. But I think Edie has all the tools and a really good supporting cast to really back up that National Player of the Year. I'd be stunned if he doesn't win it for the second year in a row because he's just a cheat code. All right, now, if you read what I wrote last week on 247sports.com, one of the big takeaways from the draftables in year one was that the best college big men aren't typically the best NBA prospects. In fact, Trace Jackson Davis, the only one who got drafted last year. I think Zach Eady is actually a sneaky good NBA prospect. I'm not saying he's a lottery prospect, but I do think he could get drafted. I do think he could play his way into the back end of the first round. Here's why. Uh, The Walker Kessler prototype, someone who's huge in drop coverage, I think that helps. The other thing is this guy is huge even by NBA standards. In fact, last year he would have been the biggest player in the NBA. So I think you're going to find a team that's going to take a chance on that, especially given his rate of improvement. Again, he's got no chance to be the first pick in the draft. Just be clear about that, even though he's the best player in college basketball. But I think he's a pretty decent NBA prospect. Isaac, the second best player in the Big Ten, according to you, is Terrence Shannon from Illinois. Yeah, strong, powerful, explosive wing. I think he's probably the best transition scorer in the Big Ten. You know, he gets a ton of free throws. He's uh, shot a lot better from the mid-range. That's been a big part of his off-season arsenal that he's trying to add. And if he can add that to go along with an improved jumper from three, you know, we've seen the creation really improve from him. And he's just an alpha. He can guard a lot of different players on the floor, too. So that two-way potential and his just explosiveness and transition and just the number of raw free throws he can generate, you know, 8, 10, 12 a game, that's a really, really special player that Brad Underwood can employ. And, you know, he started every season, I don't know, for the last three seasons as an intriguing NBA prospect. He's been on all the preseason draft boards for years. The longer this goes, I think the less intrigue there is as an NBA prospect. But this year could be interesting. He's older now, but he's going to get to play with the ball in his hands. Illinois really doesn't have a a pure point guard, and and TJ Shannon's going to be utilized, I think, as a bit of a guard. So he's going to have an opportunity to show something. Given his age, though, he's got to show that he's he's NBA ready if he wants to play his way into the first round. People are not going to bet on upside for TJ Shannon, given his age, despite the fact that he is, he's got good size, he's got good athleticism, and the shooting has got to come on. It started to come on at the beginning of last season, but he couldn't sustain it, and I think ultimately that's why he had to go back to school. All right, Isaac, you want me to prompt you, or you want to you wanna go with uh, your third guy on the Big Ten, Big Ten board here? We're going with Boo Booey, right, or are we going with Jameer Young? I, no, you had Jameer Young, 22nd overall in your top 100 list for third overall in the Big Ten. 
Yeah, he is just tough as nails. I think he really embodies Maryland basketball. And I think we've seen a big jump from transfers in their second year with the program. Tyler Kolek turned into a National Player of the Year candidate, Big East Player of the Year. Jalen Pickett turned into an All-American in his second year at Penn State. And I think we could see a similar jump from Jameer Young. He was awesome last year. I think he has a chance to be absolutely special in this second year there. But I think for me, it's like it's tough to generate, see him as an NBA guy because he's such a good college player. But I think there's some there's some questions that hold him back from an NBA potential. Yeah, so he's 23 years old. Um, he's 6'1". He's not a knockdown three-point shooter. In fact, he shot 31% last year. And he's not like an elite athlete. So some of those, usually that doesn't work in, in, in the NBA. So I will say this. He would have to be the exception to the rule uh, going into this this season at Maryland. I'll leave it at that. Uh, fourth in the Big Ten, you just said it, Boo Booey. What do you like about Boo? Northwestern runs a ton of Zoom actions, and Boo Booey comes off of them and just dives right into the lane and just gets two feet in the paint at all time. He's one of the fastest ball handlers in the Big Ten. He was a guy that honestly hurt his team early in his career. Now he's helping them, and he's just has grinded his way into becoming a really, really valuable and really terrific college basketball player. He's a threat to go for 30 every single night. He's got some huge outings for a Northwestern team and a program that's on the rise. All right, so now one of the themes you're going to see is the age of the best players in college basketball. Talked about T.J. Shannon, Jameer Young. Boo Booey turns 24 in December. Um, so from NBA standards, he's, he's, very, he's very old. And so that means, again, people aren't going to bet on his potential. It's got to be about whether or not you are ready to come in and impact the game right now. I, I buy his creativity. I actually buy his shooting potential more so than most. Uh, I think he could be more efficient in, in a more limited role, but he's a, he's a bucket. He's a playmaker. I don't know. I think he's a potential second round pick. I, I don't know at 24 years old um, that, that he's going to ping too many D1 radars, but I think he's got a way to play his way into the second round, potentially stick. Um, last but not least, your top five players in the Big Ten was Tyson Walker. He, you had 29th overall in your top 100 players in college basketball. Yeah, he was a guy. He actually had his usage rate go down. Michigan State played him off the ball more, and that turned out to be a really, really good thing for him. They turned him into a real more of a shooter than a playmaker. And we're talking about one of the best shooters in college basketball. Back-to-back -back years where he flirted with 50% from three in Big Ten play. The volume is there, and he's a stone-cold killer in late-game situations. He's going to make a ton of big shots for this Michigan State team. I don't think his raw numbers are going to be really, really high because they have so many mouths to feed. But Tyson Walker is, is a baller, man, and you do not want to see him with the ball in his hands late in the game because you're pretty much toast. And you know what I love about him is he's got terrific feel, and his shooting has really developed since high school. He, he continues to be a better shooter with each passing year. He's another one, though. He just turned 23. And listen, Michigan State, they list him at 6'1 and 185, and that may be on the generous side. Again, he's undersized. Um, but he, to me, is someone, he's not going to be a first-round pick. He doesn't fit the, the physical prototype. Um, but he, to me, is someone that, that maybe goes in the second round, maybe signs a two-way, and maybe he sticks. Like, he's the guy who's the exception to the rule, who's so smart, who's such a good culture guy, that maybe someone ends up keeping him around for those reasons. So not a prototypical NBA prospect by any stretch, but interesting. Um, all right, now we're going to flip it. Now we're going to talk about the best NBA prospects in the Big Ten. And I should preface it by saying, in my opinion, the three best NBA prospects in the Big Ten are all prospects who are young and have high ceilings but low floors. I'm going to put it another way. They're high-risk, high-reward guys. Uh, we've talked about the first two on this show before. The first one is Kalel Ware. Came out, went to Oregon last year, five-star prospect. Just talked about him in last week's show because he's got every tool you could want. He's got size, he can run, he can jump, he's got touch, he can shoot threes, he's got hands. It's just about the motor and how much he loves basketball. Now, if he can answer those questions this year at Indiana, he's got a chance to play his way into the lottery. And I say that knowing full well that the NBA has never emphasized the center position less than they do right now. But that is a big if, if he can show all that. It remains to be seen, and Isaac, correct me if I'm wrong, but. I mean, there's some other options at Indiana. If, if Kalel Ware isn't bringing it every day, it's not like Mike Woodson doesn't have a, a contingency plan there. 
Definitely. I mean, you could argue that Indiana has one of the deepest front courts in all of college basketball. Malik Renu is a kid that they love. You know, they got Peyton Sparks out of Ball State. That's a big time player. Anthony Walker out of Miami, another really, really interesting piece. So that's where the, the Kalel Ware evaluation is really different because he's going to have every opportunity to take over that Trace Jackson Davis role for Indiana. But there's no guarantee. He has to bring it every single night. And I think he can. I think Mike Woodson will put him in positions to be successful. And playing with a pass first point guard like Xavier Johnson should lead to beneficial outings for Kalel Ware and what he can bring to the table for Indiana this year. All right, we're going to keep it in Indiana. Talk about Mackenzie McBacco, another player that you and I have talked about on this show. Uh, shooter, floor spacers, put on a lot of muscle. Looks like he's going to start at the three in Indiana. I'm of the opinion that his best position is, is four, but I will say this. If he proves that he can defend a wing playing the three at Indiana this year, there's no doubt in my mind it will help his NBA stock because I think that is is kind of the concern we had coming out of high school is what position does he defend. So another player who I think is one of the more intriguing NBA prospects as we head into this season in the Big Ten. Isaac, what can we expect from him? Well, the thing with Mike Woodson is that defense isn't optional there, and they have a lot of really intriguing defensive pieces. That's why I think that McBacco could potentially stick on that end because you have Trey Galloway, you have Xavier Johnson, you have Malik Renu, you have Kalel Ware, who all can add different things defensively. I think McBacco is going to find a way to stick defensively because he's protected by some of the other pieces around him and can just focus on his job. And if he's a 3 and D wing, and if he's maybe a, a Big Ten Freshman of the Year candidate this year or, or contender or maybe even front runner, I think you could talk about Indiana, you know, being a second weekend team because this this roster is loaded with NBA talent. All right. Now, the last guy is is to me, he's this year's version of Kalel Ware. And I'm talking about Xavier Booker at Michigan State. Incoming freshman, five star prospect. It, it's almost the exact same thing. All the talent in the world. Uh, right around seven feet, moves effortlessly. I mean, covers the court in a way you, you couldn't design in a better way for a video game. Has all the touch, all the tools, has to get stronger. What's different about this situation is he's joining a Michigan State squad, and we're going to talk about them more in a minute, where he doesn't have to play big mi minutes. I mean, Matty Sissoko is going to be the starting center there. Booker can come off, potentially play a smaller role, and almost get protected a little bit because NBA teams are undeniably going to be intrigued by his tools. And he doesn't need to go out and get 20 and 10. He doesn't even need to go get 15 and 8. I think he can go out and get like 9 and 6 and still have NBA teams who are willing to buy into his long-term upside. Well, and he has to compete for it, too, because Matty Sissoko is the starter, but Jackson Kohler is a guy mm. that they want to get minutes for in that front court. Carson Cooper, a late-rising, blooming center that put on some real weight and muscle this offseason and looked great toward the end of last year. He's another guy that they want to play. So it's really on, Booker, to, to you have to go win the job here, and it will not be easy in a loaded front court that has a lot of different pieces. And Tom Izzo, we've, we've seen it before. We saw it with Jaron Jackson Jr. If you're not playing up to snuff, no matter how talented you are, you might not get the role that you might envision all right so now we've talked about the best players in the big 10 we've talked about some of the best long-term nba prospects in the big 10 let's finish this up with the best teams what you have dubbed the real contenders and we're going to stick right on michigan state what makes them arguably the number one preseason team in the big 10 yeah, they're right there with Purdue. And when you look at Michigan State, the backcourt here is just phenomenal. A.J. Hogard is a guy we haven't talked a lot about yet, but he's kind of the head of the snake here. A terrific defender. I, I call him these big boy drives that he that he puts on other point guards. He's just a terrific driver, gets into the lane and can finish through contact. And then Jaden Akins is a, one of my favorite candidates as a breakout candidate out, yeah. of, out of the Big Ten. Lefty sniper can really shoot the cover off the ball. Joey Hauser's departure is, is a big loss for them, but getting Malik Hall healthy will be huge. And if, if that leads to Aikens getting more shots, I think that's a good thing overall for Michigan State. And guards win in March. And this Michigan State team arguably has the best backcourt in the country. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. I, I think the, the, the secret sauce there for Michigan State is player retention. So they've got experience. They got old because they have Tyson Walker. They've got A.J. Hoggard. They've got Matty Sissoko. They've got Malik Hall. Uh, they've got Jaden Aiken, so I feel the same way about the Juju. Then they added a big-time recruiting class where they've got Xavier Booker. They've got Cohen, Cohen um, Carr, who I think is another NBA prospect, maybe not this year but down the road. Jeremy Fears, one of the best incoming point guards in the class. You talked about, um, you, you talked about Big Carson in the middle there. He's someone who I, I, I'm hearing is way ahead of schedule. They've got a lot of bodies. They've got a lot of depth. They can, 
they're going to be fine if somebody rolls a sprained ankle. You know, they can sustain their way through an injury. To me, the only question is the perimeter shooting. Uh, if they can sustain that, I, I really like them. But Purdue, of course, is going to be a lot of people's pick because they have Zach Eady and they also bring back quite a bit of last year's rotation. Yeah, getting Braden Smith and Fletcher Lawyer back for a second year, I think, will serve huge, huge dividends. I think if this this Purdue team has the highest floor in the Big Ten, but I think they have a really, really good ceiling, too. This is a team that was a number one seed last year. They're trying to do the Virginia, where you lose to a 16 seed and come back the following year and win the national championship. If they're able to do that, I think you're looking at Trey Kaufman-Wren taking a bigger step forward. Yeah. He was extremely efficient in post-ups last year. They're going to try to get him on the floor alongside Zach Eady. And then Miles Colvin is a bouncy freshman. He can put his collarbone on the rim, basically. And, and he's another a big wing that they haven't really had in that rotation. But honestly, if Purdue wants to get back to, to being a dominant team in March, it comes down to these guards. And Braden Smith and Fletcher Lawyer, they need these year two breakouts for them because both of them seem to hit a freshman wall toward the end of the last year. I think both of those guys are due for a really, really big year. So two points on Purdue. The, the players you mentioned there, Trey Kaufman, Wren, and Miles Calvin, I think those are uh, two of their three best um, long-term NBA prospects. I think both of those guys are going to be on NBA radars. But as it relates to last year's team at Purdue, the narrative that, that is out there, what it loses sight of is that their starting backcourt were both freshmen last year. So everybody talks about how they're a one seed and, and Matt Painter got upset and this and that. They don't talk about the fact that they really exceeded expectations to get that one seed in the first place. And now with that backcourt coming back, just as sophomores, they've really got, I think, some, some necessary experience. And then they bring back a whole lot of experience around that, too. So, so, again, I'm with you. I think Purdue, one of the best teams, not just in the Big Ten, but in the country. After Michigan State and Purdue, who else can we consider among the top threats in the Big Ten? You know, I think Maryland is a team that I'm getting higher and higher on as we get closer to the season. You know, we talk a lot about two-man actions, and I think Maryland's two-man game between Jameer Young and Julian Reese is going to be borderline unstoppable this year. They are phenomenal at home. I expect them to be dominant again at, at home, and then they have the recipe to win on the road. And I think a thing with Maryland that a lot of people are holding back on is, well, they're going to probably have two freshmen in the rotation and maybe two freshmen starting. But I love Deshaun Harris-Smith. I think he'd be my pick today for Big Ten Freshman of the Year. And then J Jamie Kaiser is a knockdown shooter with size that I feel like both of those guys just fit exactly what they need. And then you add in Dante Scott. Like, this team might not be the deepest in the Big Ten, but they have the star power. And when you have a point guard who might be the best point guard in the Big Ten and you have a big man who might be the second best big man in the Big Ten, I think you have a really, really good chance with all these other pieces in year two for Kevin Willard. Yeah, I like their first five. I agree with you on, uh, on Harris Smith. I know my colleague Travis Branham does. Um, my question there is depth and perimeter shooting, but we'll see. A team that I like perhaps a little bit more than most, I'm high in Illinois. We already talked about TJ Shannon. I am a Coleman Hawkins fan. I admittedly, I think he's an NBA player. He didn't look great at the combine last year, and, and after he, that kind of lackluster performance, he decided to come back to school. Uh, that's a huge win for Illinois to get him back. Um, there's questions in the backcourt, though, but, but I like this team. What are your thoughts on Illinois? Yeah, I think Illinois has a chance to be the best defense in the country. Hmm. Uh, Terrence Shannon, Coleman Hawkins, and Ty Rogers, when those three were on the floor together, Illinois had a 92 defensive rating last year, one of the best marks in college basketball. That three-man trio is going to be everything that Illinois wants to be defensively. I think they can be really switchable. I think they're super deep. They've gone into the portal and added a bunch of veterans. Justin Harmon out of Utah Valley. Quincy Garrier out of Oregon. They also got Marcus Domask out of Southern Illinois, who they expect a lot from. And so you have an old team, a deep team. Dane Danger is a, a guy coming off the bench. He ranked like third in the Big Ten last year in efficiency on post-ups. So you just have a lot of bodies here. Can they get sustainable point guard play? And they shoot it better, not just from three, but also from the free throw line. They got a ton of free throws last year, but didn't shoot it well. Those are kind of the recipes for Illinois to be a really good team in the Big Ten. Is Ty Rogers really going to play the point? That's, that's my question. Um, all right, we've talked about Indiana a lot. Uh, you said they have a chance to get to the second weekend. We talked about their rotation. Last team I want to ask you about is Wisconsin, another team that brings back their entire starting five. They get a key transfer. What are we to make of this group? 
that's exactly it right there. Getting all five guys back is so clutch. And I thought a lot of teams out athleted Wisconsin last year mm. and to get a guy like AJ store out of St. John's that can change things big time from their athleticism standpoint. He's the type of guy that I thought that they could have been able to get a lot more after Johnny Davis's breakout season. Uh, but another one that you have to really watch here is, is Connor season. I think he can work his way on the potential NBA radars. If this jumper sticks, cause his off ball shooting is terrific. His off ball movement shooting off of movement is really, really good. And if Steven Crowell and Tyler Wall get back to playing like we think they can, and Chucky Hepburn, obviously, you know, th this is a team that with with all of this cohesiveness, you get all five starters back, you had a transfer like that. I feel like Wisconsin's kind of running under the wave our, radar a little bit, but they, they can absolutely win this league. Interesting to note, uh, bringing their entire starting five back, they had a top 20 defense in the country last year and were top three in terms of ball security. Going to be very interesting to see what happens in a loaded Big Ten this season. A conference which I think has got a number of national championship contenders. The format is going to be the same. We're going to talk about the best players, best prospects, and then the teams that have a chance to really compete for a Big 12 championship. Isaac Trotter, he's back to help me break this down. Isaac, we are going to start with the top five players in the Big 12. You had fourth overall in your top 100, Hunter Dickinson from Kansas. The big fella's got a new zip code. What do you like about this fit? Yeah, I mean, I think it's the scene, the best fit in the transfer portal that you could have asked for for Hunter Dickinson. Kansas wants to throw their bigs the ball every single possession, and Dickinson is going to be able to go to work. He's one of the most efficient scorers in the country last year on the block. He also knocked down a bunch more threes. He really changed his game, but his passing is so huge, and Kansas has a ton of great cutters. You know, you have Kevin McCuller, great cutter. Dewan Harris is a really good cutter. K.J. Adams, great cutter. And I think you'll see a lot of Dickinson's playmaking come come into fruition. I think he's a national player of the year contender. Wow, high praise. I I I, um, I like Hunter. My favorite Hunter Dickinson memory is when I'm interviewing him on national TV. He's playing Evan Mobley. I said, Hunter, you're playing against the, the best prospect in the country. What do you think? He said, he's your best prospect in the country. I think I'm the best prospect in the country. And then he said at Michigan that he was, you know, only coming back for one more year. I think he could be in college for a long time. He is one of the best college basketball players in the country, but right now he is representative of the type of big man that is not in high demand in the NBA because he lacks defensive versatility. Can he outplay that? We're going to have to see, but I think he's terrific. He's going to be terrific for Kansas, no doubt about it. Um, second best player in the Big 12, we're going to Texas for Max A. Smith. Did I pronounce? Is that right? Max A. Smith, yes, out of Oral Roberts. He spells uh, it absolute. Ab Moss. He spells it Ab Moss, but whatever. You know what? Uh, his name might be hard to pronounce, but his game is really easy to love. He like is it. a big time, big time shooter. You know, he kind of got Damian Lillard like logo range. You know, the moment they set high ball screens for him, you better have a hand up because he can pull from anywhere inside of half court. Playmaking is really good. I love the Texas fit. And you talk to rival coaches. I think a lot of people are, you know, sometimes when you have guards that try and transfer up from the mid-major drinks to the high major drinks, they're a little skeptical. Everybody you talk to thinks that Max A. Smith is going to crush it at Texas, and I tend to believe him. He's one of the best players in college basketball. I think he could give Dickinson a run for his money for Big 12 Player of the Year and be an All-American. Like, he's, he's a terrific, terrific player. All right, before I give my NBA take, I'm going to hold because I think this next guy is in a similar boat. That's uh, Tyler Perry from Kansas State your third best player in the Big 12, 17th overall in the country. What do you like about him? In a similar vein as Ace Smith, you know, he's just got in the gym range. He makes tough shots all the time. North Texas played at a really, really slow tempo, one of the slowest tempos in all of college basketball last year. Kansas State, far different. They're going to play fast. They're going to play up-tempo. They're going to get after it in, in transition. And Perry, just being the big-time shot maker that he is, just, I mean, just an elite, elite shot maker. I think he made 42% of his 133s off the bounce last year. I think he could put up even huger numbers in a Kansas State offense that's super, super free flowing and here's the thing that people have to understand these undersized volume scoring guards they are not prototypical NBA prospects I'm not saying these guys aren't going to make it I'm just saying they would have to be the exception to the rule in order to do it uh, Kansas State I would cite Marquise Noel the, the hero the darling of March Madness had very little NBA intrigue y you got to have you got to be the exception to the rule at that size regardless of how good of a college player you are I will throw this in there Arthur Kaluma, Naquan Tomlin, 
Those are the players on Kansas State that I think are probably the best NBA prospects. Speaking of big men, West Virginia, Jesse Edwards is your fourth best player in the Big 12. You've got him 21st overall. The Syracuse transfer is now all of a sudden going to play a huge role in Morgantown. Yeah, it's kind of one of those situations where it's a different job description for him, but I think that it might be a good thing. He gets to showcase what he can do defensively, playing a lot more man-to-man -man defense instead of just sitting around in a 2-3 zone um, as a rim protector. But I think he's a great lob threat. He's really improved as a post scorer. And this, this West Virginia team is really prepared to feature him on both ends of the floor. He's going to be as impactful as any player in the country. He's kind of everything for them on both ends of the floor. Yeah, and I think you said a key to his NBA stock right there. Teams are going to get to see him in man-to-man. In -man. They're going to get to see whether he can guard ball screens. Uh, we're going to get to see if his shot blocking translates to the same extent. If he can do those two things, uh, I think there's going to be some NBA intrigue with him right now because if you look at the bigs who were picked in last year's draft, rim protection was the common denominator. Jesse Edwards is as good as it gets, and he's every bit the lob threat you said. Uh, your fifth best player in the Big 12 is uh, Jamal Sheed at, at Houston. Yeah, I think when you look at Jamal Shedd, it's like tough, versatile, you know, junkyard dog. I think I think he's the head of the snake for this Houston team defensively. Uh, but Kelvin Sampson is hard to play for. He always has super high expectations for his point guards. And so he's really talked all offseason about how Shedd needs to take another step forward. And I think he can. I, you know, you're having Marcus Sasser. He's off to the NBA. And I, now Shedd, it's kind of his team to run a little bit. And they're going to get some different pieces in there. But they go as Shed goes on both ends of the floor, and I think he's he's due for a really, really big year for a Houston team that's joining the Big 12, but I think they have as much talent to win the league as anybody. All right, now, you know, people are going to talk about Sasser, but his NBA upside, again, there's not a great prototype. There's not a great track for players like him. The guy he reminds me of is Davion Mitchell, who, who was a lottery pick coming out of Baylor for the Kings. Uh, Shed is going to have to try and convince people he can follow that prototype, but on the surface, just not... A, an obvious NBA prospect because of the lack of size and shooting, just 29% career three-point shooter. Let's talk about the best NBA prospects in the Big 12. Again, this is going to come down to some of the younger players, which means they're going to be potentially high-risk, high-reward. We talked uh, about Kansas, Hunter Dickinson, the best player on the team. I think Elmarco Jackson might be the best prospect. Now, he's going to play next to Dewan Harris, who's going to be the pure point guard of that team. But Jackson is going to be able to play off the ball and simultaneously kind of sell NBA executives on his ability to play the point at the next level. As he's going to be a secondary ball handler now. And I think this is actually a good recipe for him to intrigue people with what he does best, his size, his power, his athleticism, his two-way impact because he can defend. If he can be reliable with the jumper, I think he's a one-and-done candidate. Well, and I think his year one role completely changed after Arterio Morris was yeah. kicked off the team for a terrible situation um, with legal trouble there. And now El Marco Jackson kind of becomes an enormous part of what Kansas wants to do. I think before with Arterio Morris in the mix, you're like, OK, how many minutes can you project for El Marco? Now, I think he's probably a 25 to 28 minute type of guy. And that's a good thing in a winning culture like this. I think he's going to show a lot of those winning attributes that a lot of people liked. Just look at Christian Brown just a couple years ago. Jacoby, Jacoby Walter is, in my mind, one of the best NBA prospects in the Big 12. It's going to be really interesting. You go on the Baylor website right now, they list him as a forward. I love that because everybody's trying to exaggerate their position. They're not calling him a guard. They're not even calling him a wing. I think he is a wing for what it's worth. They call him a forward, which I just think is like, you know, just total truth serum. Uh, again, I think he's a wing. If he makes shots, he's got a potential to be kind of a 3 and D prototype that could intrigue NBA teams um, may, potentially sooner rather than later. He's by no means a guaranteed one and done, uh, but he's someone that could play his way into that status, in my opinion. Yeah, and getting Ray J. Dennis just makes his life so much easier. You know, I think having a veteran point guard, Ray J. Dennis had one of the top assist rates in all of college basketball last year. That just changes the dynamic for what Walter will be. And they have to, you know, they have to replace a bunch of scoring after Adam Flagler left, LJ Cryer left. Obviously, they lost a, a big time freshman uh, in, the, in the draft. And now you have a situation where Walter has to come in and fill that void. And he's going to have every opportunity to be, you know, I mean, arguably their highest usage player, honestly, I think. Another potential one-and-done prospect in the Big 12 is over at Iowa State, and that is Omaha Blue. 
and arguably one of the best front court defenders in terms of freshmen and all of college basketball. But what impressed me this summer was the progression of his skill set. Now, Isaac, I got to admit, I'm a little confused with, with, with this guy because I went out to the USA Basketball 19s. I saw the trials. I thought he was putting himself in a position to be one of the anchors of this team, and it did not end up being that way. So I'm very curious to see what happens this year at Iowa State. Does the progression in this skill set, does it carry over to the season? If it does, he's going to be another guy who's got a chance to be one and done because he's got all the tools to be a versatile defender. He's got a great body type that translates up. But I'm just a little confused by what I saw this summer. Well, and I think defensively, he's going to the one of the best defensive coaches in all of college basketball. TJ Otzelberger has been, you know, a, a high, high floor defensive team for a long time. He's going to get his guys playing in the passing lanes, trying to create turnovers, being a little bit of risk takers at times while also having some sound principles. He's going to be really, really well coached on the defensive end. I wouldn't be surprised about, at all if he turns into their stopper right away. Like that's the type of role that I think they need from him. I'm just as curious as you on what his offensive role looks like and if it's all as a secondary piece or if he can ever kind of turn that up and kind of be a go-to shot maker for them. All right, now the last guy I'm going to talk about here, full confession, I am, uh, I'm just hanging on, trying to defend my, my past take that didn't work out so well. Uh, Dylan Mitchell had him as a top 10 prospect coming into college. He started for a Texas team that was one of the best in the country, but the numbers just weren't there, um, and he was farther away than, than we thought coming out of high school, quite frankly. I've said this before, I'll say it again. I think the role contributed to the perception of him last year. And I think they have to do more to free him up for what he does best, showcase his elite athleticism. This guy is as mobile and fluid with flexible hips, explosive athleticism as it comes. I mean, we're talking about like highest level Derek Jones caliber athlete, but he's got to have more production. He's got to be a scoring threat away from, from the rim. And I think weaponize his physical tools a little bit more on the defensive end. Um, some of the some of the history in terms of high profile freshmen who put up numbers like him uh, in their first year in college they're not encouraging but i don't want to give up on him just yet because he's he's too athletic and he's also got got the high character am i just am i just holding on here is this over no, it's not. It's not over. I think the role here really matters a lot for mm. what Texas wants to do. They they go into the portal. They get Caden Shedrick. They get Dylan DeSue back. I think Rodney Terry and Co. need to split up as many of those 80 front court minutes between those three guys. I, I don't necessarily love the idea of putting Dylan Mitchell at the three alongside both Shedrick and DeSue. I don't think that elevates his strengths. But I think using him as a four, using him as a roller, I think that can start to showcase a little bit more of what he can do and what he honestly would do at the next level as well. So getting him in situations with one other big man, I think is a huge key for Texas, not necessarily two. All right, Jalen Bridges at Baylor, Terrence Arsenault at Houston, two other NBA prospects I am intrigued with in the Big 12. Uh, there's going to be a full list of them, 247sports.com. But now I want to talk about the real contenders. We've already talked about Kansas. They've got the best player in the league. They've got the best prospect in the league. I think they have arguably the best pure point guard in the league and Dewan Harris. K.J. Adams is back. Kevin McCuller is back. Uh, are they the team to beat? I think so. I think so. I think Nick Timberlake is the last little missing piece for them out of Towson. You know, the, the offseason noise on him hasn't been overly lovely, but I think it's a situation where he's going to get back to doing what he needs to do for them. Just being a knockdown catch and shoot guy, I think he's a really good fit for them schematically. I think once he gets to play against other guys, maybe not practice against all these dudes, I think he's going to be able to show what he can do. But on paper, Texas a little bit thin now after the Arteria Moore, or um, excuse me, Kansas a little thin after the Arteria Moore situation. But I do think that their top six is absolutely loaded and they're they just all their pieces just work and when you give a bill self a roster like this like good things are going to happen yeah i'm curious to see if zach clements or jamari mcdowell can kind of crack that rotation and, and provide some depth off the bench um second in your real contender list is baylor it's really interesting because baylor has been this perimeter oriented team for years um, we've seen multi guards coming at you in waves and they had to go to the portal to kind of get their guards for this season. What are your expectations for them heading into the year? 
Yeah, I have a lot of trust in Scott Drew and this staff that they're going to figure out some things and get it right again. Offensively, it's not been an issue for years under Baylor, but defensively, last year was one of their worst marks in over a decade. They finished well outside the top 100 defensively. They can't play like that and win a Big 12 championship, no matter how good their offense is. So I don't think their offense is going to be the second best in the country like it was last year. But I think it can be a top 15 offense, and then you have, like, a defense that takes a lot of steps forward with Jaden Nunn, Ray J. Dennis. They're a lot bigger. Miro Little is another freshman we like. We've already talked about how much Jacoby Walter will impact that team and Jalen Bridges. They're, they're deep in the front court as well. Like, they have a lot of pieces there. But most importantly, they have a staff that I really, really trust to get this right. Yeah, I would agree with that. The other name I would mention for them is Eves Missy, who reclassified up to become a freshman. I think he is a another very solid NBA prospect in this Big 12, someone who could play an immediate role, maybe even be the team's starting center as a freshman. Uh, Want to talk about Houston. All they do is win down there. Jamal Shedd, he's back to run the team. They got LJ Cryer over from Baylor. Um, what does this mean for Kelvin Sampson's club? Yeah, they needed the Marcus Sasser replacement, and that's LJ Cryer to a T, just an absolute score. But you got a guard to play for Houston, and LJ Cryer has to answer that question as well. He's being paid very handsomely through NIL to come to Houston, and now it's his opportunity to showcase that he can show a little of his point guard duties, show what he can do as a two-way player. But he's there to score, and he's going to score a lot. And Damian Dunn is another piece I really like out of Temple. I think he's a great piece for them defensively. He adds a lot of length and a really good shot maker. And then, you know, you look at this Houston team, they're built on defense. They're going to trap the post. That's what they do. They have a lot of old vets that know this system really, really well. So I expect Houston to be one of the best defensive teams because that's what Kelvin Sampson does. He just that's he creates great defenses out of nothing every single year. I'm really intrigued by Damian Dunn. I'm, I'm fascinated to see what he can become here. And if he, he develops some some NBA following as the year goes on. All right, the last two teams I want to talk about here are Texas and Kansas State. We already talked about both of these teams having some of the best players and best prospects. Dylan Mitchell for Texas. Um, we've got Max Amos and some others. Tyrese Hunter we didn't talk about as well. Are these guys legit contenders this year, Isaac? I do. I think so. I think Texas's top five is terrific. I think their sixth guy coming off the bench is going to be really, really good, good as well. And if you get Ace Smith on the floor along with Tyrese Hunter, and then the big other addition is Ith Horton out of UCF. Great veteran shot maker. That's exactly what they needed because it frees up the ability to play the Sioux or Shedrick or um, your boy Dylan Mitchell. You can you can kind of mix guy. and match with that that crew right there. So I think you can have a situation where Texas the roster looks a lot better now than it was because people were panicking a lot earlier in this cycle about what Texas was going to do after the Ron Holland fiasco, after they lost another five star freshman as well. So this roster looks a whole lot better than what it did a couple months ago. And last but not least, Kansas State, I think they were picked last in the preseason last year and, and just made an incredible run there. Uh, what do we expect this season? Yeah, Jerome Tang, a lot of respect for him and what he's able to build. And he goes into the portal and says, I want dudes. He got a couple of them. And I think Tyler Perry is obviously a dude. I think he's a Big 12 Player of the Year candidate. Arthur Kaluma. He has really been an interesting candidate there because Creighton had a lot of really good players. And Kaluma just felt a little bit on the outside looking in at times. I think this is his opportunity to be like, you know, the second best player on this team. He needs to be the really, really impactful 16 points a game guy. He has to shoot it better from three. He has to add a little bit more variety to his off the bounce game. He has to improve his handle. I think he can. And Kansas State seems to get the best out of these guys. So Kansas State steps is still a little bit of a question. They have some freshmen that are rising that you feel really good about. But if, if Kansas State wants to go far again, it's because Tyler Perry is awesome and Arthur Kaluma is really, really good. And I would just add to that, keep an eye on Naquan Tomlin, an intriguing, albeit somewhat old, NBA prospect who's going to be very important in the middle on both ends of the floor for them. Isaac, we broke down the Big Ten, the Big 12. We've got at least four more to come in the upcoming weeks. Thanks so much for joining us here today. Anytime. All right, that is College Basketball Recruiting Weekly. As I said, this is just the first of three college basketball preview shows. We're going to talk about the best college players, the best NBA prospects, and the best contending teams in every power conference in college basketball. You can find us here every week on the 24-7 Sports channel. And until next week, be sure to visit 247sports.com for the latest in college basketball, the NBA draft, and high school recruiting.